given a, a diagram that uh, you might enjoy. It's a, I think if this was in Life magazine, they call it the Ascent of Man or something. And they have a series of these prehistoric ma men, and I have to read you the captions. You can't, I'm sorry you can't appreciate the artwork from up there. But um, the first one is the Heidelberg man, built from the, a, a jawbone that was conceded by many to be quite human. Uh, <laughs> after the Heidelberg man, we have the Nebraska man, scientifically built up from one tooth. You know, it's interesting how efficient, you know, efficiency is defined as coming to creating vast amount of conclusions from very little data. And uh, for the, Heidel the uh, Nebraska man as an example of that, that tooth later was found to be the tooth of an extinct pig. <laughs> Next comes the Piltown man with the jawbone that it was built upon. It uh, turned out to belong to a modern ape. Then Peking man. 500,000 years old, although all evidence of it has disappeared. The Anderthal man at the International Congress of Zoology in 1958, Dr. A.J.E. Cave, said that his examination of the famous Neanderthal skeleton found in France over 50 years ago is that of an old man who suffered from arthritis. <laughs> then we have Cro-Magnon man. One of the earliest and best established fossils is at least equal in physique and brain capacity to modern man. So what's the difference? And then we have, finally, in the whole climax of the series, we have modern man, and he's just labeled, this genius thinks we came from the monkey. <laughs> and then they're all worshiping a statue, which is a big, you know, gorilla, and it says, uh, our father on it, and then it says, uh, from Romans 1.22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. But the point being not just that the classical recreations of, of uh, you know, prehistoric man are error, are an error is that in the most cases, they were deliberate frauds. It was not just misguided good intentions. It, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. The fossils say no by Gish, G-I-S-H. Thank you. Very interesting work. You find, of course, the libraries are full of fascinating works on evolution and creation and so forth. That's an interesting book because it gets into the legally, you know, the legal background of some of the deliberate frauds that were uh, presumably in an intent to uh, gain publicity and notoriety that cloud the whole history of paleontology. And it's too bad. In terms of evidence of design, um, we could, it, it, it's, it's, it's tempting just to list all kinds of, of, of things, but uh, so I'd like to just leave you with a few. Now we can look at the human eye. You know, I used my little watch analogy the other evening in terms of you know, the absurdity that complexity uh, can occur without a designer is, of course, absurd, so absurd to be humorous. And we've talked about the hand of things. The human eye is an interesting study in its own right between, in terms of being just an incredible self-focusing uh, camera. But um, what's, what most of you probably would not have occasion to realize is that the eye is sensitive to a very, very narrow spectrum in the, in, the frequency, in, the, in the different frequencies that it could have been a receptor of. We speak of the range, you know, its particular band is the visible light range, well, that's because that's the eye sensitive to it. But it's bounded, just to give you a, a feeling for this, on the one side by the infrared, and on the other side by the ultraviolet. There are all kinds of frequencies, emissions, and so forth, the eye cannot see. I mean, there's nothing wrong with infrared. We design missiles to track infrared. If you go to a doctor, he can give you a thermograph to see if there's an occlusion in your in your uh, arteries, veins, what have you. It's a useful medical instrument to look at the thermograph or the you know, infrared. Ultraviolet is a very, very valuable form of emission. What's interesting, though, is that if you were a very, very experienced engineer and knew all there is to know about communications theory and you wanted to design a sensor with an optimum signal to noise ratio, maximum of information and a minimum of noise or error, you would optimize the eye the way we have one. You would not have it receptive to those frequencies which would cause confusion or cause noise as opposed to signal. And that's exactly what we have in our eye. And studies of the eye lead to the remarkable discovery that it's optimized as a, as a sensor 
as a general purpose sensor, which I think is remarkable for, for that to happen by chance without the evidence of a designer. Concept of evolution is a violation of the second law of thermodynamics, the entropy laws. Whenever you have a mutation, it goes to disorder, not more order, a higher level, goes to a lower level. Never observed it otherwise. And this whole idea that random functionality can create order is something we never observe in the, in, in the universe, never have. Viruses are the simplest living things that we know of. And the simplest virus that we know of has 600 protein molecules in it. But by computer analysis, scientists have determined that the simplest possible living thing that could exist anywhere in the universe would have to be composed of a minimum of 239 protein molecules. Now, by protein molecules, I mean these uh, twisted double helices uh, called DNA or RNA molecules. These things, these complicated molecules uh, that are in the nucleus of every cell, that are in every virus, that are in every living thing, and they determine the character of that living thing and also uh, are responsible for its reproduction. Without these protein molecules, life is impossible. And it's a basic form of life. Simplest possible living thing requires a minimum of 239 protein molecules. Each of these protein molecules contains an average of 445 amino acids. Each slot in the protein molecule must be filled by one of 20 different biological amino acids. If one of these amino acids is slotted in the wrong way, then that protein molecule cannot do its job. One mistake, and it fails. Using your probability theory, it's one chance in the number of different amino acids, 20, to the number of amino acids in each protein molecule, 445, times the number of protein molecules in the system, which is 239, divided by 239 factorial. 239 factorial is 239 times 238 times 237 times 236, and so on, all the way down to 2 times 1. Well, if you've got a pocket calculator, uh, that works out to 1 chance in 10 to the 137,915. However, we ignored several basic assumptions. The amino acids must first be activated by specific enzymes. If the enzyme, which is a complicated molecule, is not there, then the amino acid cannot be slotted in. Further, multiple special enzymes are needed to bind the RNA molecule to the ribosome. That word ribosome simply stands for the building site of these molecules. And lastly, only left-handed amino acids can be used. Amino acids come in two types, left-handed and right-handed. If you get one right-handed amino acid into one of these molecules, the whole thing fails. So you can only use left-handed ones. Now then, we can put these factors into our probability calculation, and we discover that the chance of random assembly is now only 1 in 10 to the 15 billion. That's the number one with 15 billion zeros after it. To put that number in perspective, it would fill 3,000 Bibles with zeros. That's how big that number is. Does life come about by chance? Let's look at that possibility. The age of the universe is about 10 to the 18 seconds. So you can say, well, I mean, we can uh, try this experiment for the entire age of the universe, trying to slot amino acids together by chance. But the universe is only 10 to the 18 seconds old. Furthermore, the amount of material in the universe is only 10 to the 80th fundamental particles. That's all the protons, neutrons, electrons, neutrinos, pi mesons, muons, and 55 other fundamental particles. If you add those all up, they would only come to 10 to the 80th. 10,000 fundamental particles are required to make one amino acid. So even if you were to convert the entire physical universe into amino acids, you would only have 10 to the 76 amino acids. So if you were to put all those amino acids into a big shoebox and shake it up for the entire age of the universe, 
you're not even close to denting this one in 10 to the 15 billion. So it's really absurd to talk about life coming about by chance, even under the most ideal of circumstances. We, we can, everywhere we look in the creation, we find evidence of a designer. And I've tried to select a few things that you might find interesting. You know, one of the things that you're all aware of, I'm sure, if you've done any uh, biological, biology study, is the structure of flowers. Incredible structure of flowers, a sexual structure that requires the participation of an animal, pollination, for them to propagate, okay? Now that's, you know, I have a tough time arranging some kind of evolutionary scenario to make that plausible. The fact that it requires participation of other animals is just the beginning of the story. Do you know that there are flowers that if a bee, not designed flower, if an or, a bee goes in, that the pollen will suffocate him? He won't live? And what keeps him from suffocating are brushes on his knees. Now, I really... I really would love to see an evolutionist deal with that because if that occurred by, you know, natural selection, the first guy that doesn't have them dies. So I wonder how by trial and error you eventually have a worker bee with brushes on his knees which causes the thing to get, allow him to get in there without suffocating. I brought in a few articles. First of all... Um, there have been a couple of articles, and I, I had two, and I'm frustrated because I couldn't find the one that I wanted, but I did find one from the Wall Street Journal. This happens to be from June 15th of 79, so it's like a year ago. But um, it has an article on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. It says, Modern Creationists Seeking Equal Time. And it's just a, re a summary of the fact that the pro-creationist movement has gained a lot of momentum, and respectability. There's another article. Actually, I remember, I remember two articles, and I went through my own archives. I happen to have an archive of these things. And I found this one. I just didn't find the other one because I, I seem to misplace it. But it just, it just points out that uh, there is a organized, effective movement afoot by, the, uh, by several, but the one that it particularly gives credit to is the Creation Research Institute right down here in San Diego. doing a very, very effective job at, at, at enlisting the uh, involvement of first-class scientists not Christian guys like maybe myself who mean well, but guys who really know what they're doing and publishing sophisticated articles in sophisticated journals and gaining a momentum for the validity of the creationist point of view. In fact, the article I couldn't find, but I remember it very well, was fun because it was another, it happened to be in the journal. Uh, that's why I, just, I remembered it. It was over on the left side. I couldn't lay my hands on it. The gist of the article was that the debates that are organized are generally won by the creationists. And the reason they are is really funny. In fact, the journal had a lot of fun. They really poked fun at the evolutionist in the article. That's why I wish I could get my hands on it to share with you. Because the creationists in the, deba the debating teams that they field are better informed with facts, and they keep the discussion on a scientific basis. And the trap that the evolutionists fall into is the religious argument. And they lose the debates because they get devastated because the creationists insist upon keeping it on a scientific basis, on a non-religious basis, and win the debates. And it's really funny is that the evolutionists retreat to emotion and religion and other things, uh, and, and, and it's very, very funny. But it just mentions that, you know, uh, 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 in here, you know, you know, dogs are always a dog and a frog didn't turn into a prince and so forth. It's the flavor of this thing. And the wall... And uh, they point out the creationists tend to win and the, some, of the, some, you know, some fairly substantially competent textbooks are finally uh, making, are available to the educators that are willing to, to uh, do this. And uh, it's interesting, some of the concessions, the fact that there was a sudden burial of the, of the fossils is now acknowledged by the uh, evolutionists and so forth. The scientific evidence for creation is overwhelming, says David Minton and so forth. And, and uh, more and more reasonable scientists are speaking out against the silly theory of evolution and uh, um, so forth. And it's interesting... Uh, um, uh, the fossil records, and so it, you can use the, the very the very retreat of the evolutionist is used by the creationist uh, effectively. So um, I couldn't. I, I really meant to get this other article. I couldn't find it to share with you, which is humorous because it, the Wall Street Journal editors really <laughs> tore up the um, conduct of the evolutionist.
whole hypothesis of the evolutionists that the offspring inherit the traits of the parents, right? Well, you have a tough time with worker bees because neither the drone nor the queen have the apparatus or the ability to collect honey or make beeswax. We classically have been taught in school that there was a whirling mass and you know, out of this came the sun and the planets and so forth. And scientists recently are very embarrassed by that idea because it's almost mathematically disprovable. And uh, one of the books, if you're technically inclined, I mentioned before, is the CETI papers, the Communication with Extraterrestrial Intelligence Conference. It was given to the Soviet Union in 71, at, uh, cooperatively with, with scientists from the U.S. and the Soviet Union. And the papers have been translated and they're published as a book called Communication for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. It'll be in our bibliography, uh, edited by Carl Sagan, published by the MIT Press. It's a very interesting tactical excursion because these guys are unbelievers just commenting on the possibility of communicating with life in outer space, but in so doing, establish probabilities of life existing at all. They point out there's no data. There's one data point, the Earth experience. And if it exists, is it organized? Does it have a language? Does it have the resources to communicate? There's a whole list of probabilities you have to deal with, and they use this as a structure for a very interesting interdisciplinary conference. But among the problems they point out, they get into this cosmology discussion, and they point out the difficulties with the idea that the sun was the origin of the planets, and it has to do with the conservation of angular momentum. Okay, 90% of the angular momentum is in the planet that have only 5% of the mass of the solar system. And grappling with that is a real bear trying to come up with some scenario that will explain it. And it's a very oft-talked-about scientific issue. The other thing you should be aware of is that astronomical geometric methods and the assumptions that underlie them make any distance more than 330 light years totally uncertain. We're glibly taught in planetariums and what have you that this star or that star is so many billions of light years away. It turns out that the methods are very uncertain and more importantly, there is no assurance of the uniformity of light speeds over those distances. And you take away the uniformity hypothesis and you've got a real problem. There exist today models of relativity and, and space curvature that yield light motions that will reach the Earth from infinite sources within a few years. I don't mean to say that to be able to explain it, but some of the presumptions and background that you hear some of these things are uh, lacking caveats that should be associated in view of our more contemporary understanding of modern physics. What about color? Have you ever noticed how pretty flowers are? Why are flowers beautiful? To attract bees. You know, that's what everybody thought until recently they discovered they're colorblind. <laughs> You know, you know, it's a very interesting, dis to me, it's one of those trivial things you'll read in textbooks. I think that's profound. Um, someone gave me a list <coughs> that I, I, I won't go through the whole thing in detail, but it actually lists 33 evidences of a young Earth. Scientific data that, if objectively analyzed, implies that the entire planet Earth is less than 10,000 years old. And I'll go through a number of these just to give you a flavor of it. There are oil gushers. There's oil bed pressures that indicate an age of less than 10,000 years. And there's a, t there's a, a journal article in the book in the Science Magazine uh, referred to. Carbon-14 disintegration versus production that there's arguments, uh, anything over 3,500 years tends to get suspect. Between 5,600 years and 11,200 11, years ago, uh, if you do an error analysis on the carbon-14, you get an argument. Decay of the Earth's magnetic moment. There's a complex thing in a very specialized field, but also speaks of the creation of the Earth with an age less than 10,000 years. Certain large stars, there's arguments can be built. Atmospheric healing, helium, uh, Mississippi, Mississippi Delta filling. Uh, implies 4,000 years, surprisingly enough. Certain ocean concentrations having to do with the metal ions in the ocean suggest a few thousand years aging. Uh, there are some erosion arguments from certain cliffs. Um, there, it goes on to sea ooze, earth spin, ocean sediment, volcanic water and rocks, influx of cosmic dust, comet decay, mutation load, population statistics, stellar radiation, cosmic dust velocity. I'll try to skim some of the more technical ones. Um, earth heat lunar inert gases, stalagmites, and stalactites. Um, the Earth That Perished is a book that I'll make reference to when we get to the flood, but I'm very fond of a photograph they have there of the stalactites, or anyway, the vertical ones, 
that drip under the, they're five feet long, and they're under the Lincoln Memorial, which was built in 1923, which uh, is uh, clearly dated by classical like type analysis as being millions of years old. Um, uh, Topsoil arguments, geological features. Niagara Falls has a, has a, has a, uh, there's a analysis there. Moon radioactive dust, hydrogen, total hydrogen in the universe, uh, moon radiation, short-lived lunar isotopes, and atmospheric oxygen, and it could go on. This, each one of these comes from a specialized field of science. To go into it, number one would require background that only a few of these I might be competent to even explain. There are creation science associations. This one, this list was, came from the Creation Science Association of Orange County. Those of you interested, it's right here in Irvine. You can come up afterwards to get an address. Um, in the bibliography that I hope to have printed for next time, uh, there will be books. Those of you that are really interested in creation um, uh, can find ample books to get into these things depending on your particular level of interest. Those of you that are more general in your background but would like to get into a general discussion of cosmology, the study of the origin of the universe, would find several books interesting. One of the books that is heavy but good reading by Henry Morris and uh, John Whitcomb is The Genesis Flood. Those of you that haven't read Emanuel Vilikowski's World in Collision will find it fascinating. Even though, I don't, I don't, to the best of my knowledge, he's not a believer. He's just a very interesting writer, provocative writer. And um, the book, though, that I think many of you that have at least some feeling for technology might enjoy is a small paperback by James Reed, published by Zondervan. Reed spelled R-E-I-D, God, the Atom, and the Universe. And he goes into the young Earth statistics. He also goes into the um, uh, ref refutation of the Big Bang Theory to a newer theory which involves a dark sun. And that's extremely interesting to Genesis students in terms of what the current thinking in, 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 in secular cosmology is. And uh, it gets into plasmas and all of that if you're interested in magnetohydrodynamics. One of my favorites is a seahorse. How many know what a seahorse? Do you know that a seahorse is a marsupial? We have an aquarium, saltwater aquarium at home, and that's one of the things that I'm trying to point out to my daughter is a seahorse is a marsupial. That means he carries his young in a pouch, like a kangaroo. The only problem is that among seahorses, it's the male that has the pouch. Now, you, when you think about that on the way driving home, give me a scenario under the theme of evolution and the survival of the fittest thing and what have you that caused and you'd caused this to survive where the male has the pouch and carries the young and the female doesn't. And I just, I personally think that's just an evidence, one of many evidences of God's sense of humor. Um, in every field, you can find your favorite examples. Um, the field of uh, the DNA molecule uh, people are fascinated because a DNA molecule is a coding chain and it lends itself to coding theory. And the probability of creating any arbitrary protein molecule, a DNA molecule, turns out to be on the order of 10 to the with 130 zeros after it, or 10 to the 130th power, which is interesting because if you tried making one of those randomly once every second, that's a lot. Uh, the universe is regarded by most of the scientists as, uh, as that uh, ascribed to the sort of thing that it's a 10 billion years old. Well, if you made one for every second for 10 billion years, you only have 10 to the 17th tries to make a 10 to the 130th kind of event. It wasn't time. You say, well, I'm going to move a little faster. Um, I'll try to make one not every second or every thousandth of a second or every millionth of a second. I'll deal in those speeds that computer engineers talk about, nanoseconds, a billionth of a second. And I'll try, an arbitrary try, once every billionth of a second as a generation cycle to try and make an amino acid. And I have only 10 to the, that's 10 to the 9th times 10 to the 17th or 10 to the 26th to do something that is as rare as 1 in 10 to the 130th. So you statistically, if you want to build a chi-square analysis or some other statistical organized approach, statistically organized approach, you can prove that chance as the rival conjecture has no rational possibility of being considered if you're going to be scientific about it. You cannot deny the presence of a designer. You know, um, there has been a, a tendency for many of us to, that are victims of what I'll call an elementary school concept of science, to speak of, of you know, to, it, we're, we're, we're prey in our thinking to the evolutionist argument. 
the evolution, uh, uh, those of you that are gamblers know that if you have a poor bet that's biased in favor of the house, it doesn't matter how many times you play it, you're still going to lose. And the mentality of the evolution is that any, any odds are okay if you play them long enough. Now, the odds are several billion to one against you, but that's okay. We're going, to, we're going to play it again and again for billions of years. And somehow that mentality justifies these ridiculous scientific conclusion, hypotheses that they attempt to uh, validate. And um, uh, most of us that know anything about probabilities know that if you've got a bias against you, gee, the more you play it, the more that's going to accumulate against you. And uh, that's exactly the predicament that the evolutionists have. But the other, the, 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 uh, the other side of this is the presumption that somehow, the, you know, the whole survival of the fittest idea, that nature somehow will tend to correct itself. That's sort of the presumption that underlies evolution. It happens that that presumption underlies their, undermines their argument, because nature will tend to go to the status quo, not towards an increase in sophistication through mutations. So but we've covered that. But the other thought that needs to be mentioned is this whole idea of ecology. That's not a new word. It's been of interest in the scientific community for centuries. But it's gotten a lot of popular interest in the popular press in, say, the last 10 years or so. And the one thing we've learned that we've become aware of is that, the, that we live not in a self-correcting ecology, but quite the contrary, one that's in, very, in a very delicate balance, and where imbalances tend to disrupt. Okay, if you think that through, if you, uh, with an understanding, a modern understanding of ecology, the fact that it's delicate and it's not self-correcting. If you think that through, that utterly devastates the evolutionary argument uh, for our present situation. Now, if you want a specific, interesting example of that, sometime do a study of the Aswan Dam. The Aswan Dam was to solve all the flooding of the Nile problems and so forth, and the Soviet Union spent a lot of money uh, helping the Egyptians construct this thing. Big modern marvel, the Aswan Dam. And uh, there have been many articles uh, published that suggest that the best thing that could ever happen for Egypt is to blow it out of the thing because, but turns out, all kinds of unforeseen ramifications of that occur. Because the flooding of the Nile doesn't flood anymore, the infusion of the salt water has killed certain kind of micro, you know, life that, upon which their industries depended. All the flax is gone because it depended upon certain things of the salt water because there isn't the flooding anymore uh, change. And also the fishing industry is devastated. And we could go through uh, a whole summary, not only of the economic devastation of the Aswan Dam in, e in Egypt, but what's most interesting, you can read all this for prophesied by Isaiah in chapter 19. The two laws of thermodynamics, which Einstein himself said in classical thermodynamics is the only physical theory of the universe um, concerning which he's convinced that in the framework of, its, of the applicability of its basic concepts, it will never be overthrown. The two fundamental laws of thermodynamics, namely that there's no, that the amount of the energy in the universe is a constant. It cannot be created or destroyed, taking the mass energy together. And secondly, that all energy transforms go downhill. There's no such thing as a 100% efficient process which is the entropy law, said another way, is that we're all winding, that, that things occur between a temperature difference. And as since they, don't, they occur imperfectly, they tend to reduce those differences, and eventually the universe, at least conceptually, would be of uniform temperature, and there would be no ability to do work. And all thermodynamic processes go to that area, which is a uniform temperature, or put another way, randomness. Order is the opposite of randomness, the opposite of entropy. The entropy laws are observed everywhere in the universe. It's one exception. That's called life, and we'll deal with that when we get to the creation of life. Now, uh, but understanding, by the way, that chance is the antithesis of structure refutes the, uh, the uh, evolutionary hypothesis and is linked to the curse in Romans 8, 21 and 22. I know I'm going to say a couple of words on Darwinian evolution, because I know this is still taught in the schools, in spite of the fact that biochemists, physical chemists, astrophysicists have long ago abandoned the theory as being totally unworkable. The anthropologists still push it, but your average anthropologist has very little training in biochemistry, physical chemistry, or astrophysics. And so I brought along with me a biology textbook 
I think is used throughout most of California, high school biology textbook, and it pushes Darwinian evolution. And here's a plot of the evolution of the horse. Now, I don't want to criticize this textbook too strongly. It is pretty up-to-date, one of the most up-to-date textbooks we have in the school. But in terms of the information explosion, it's a long way behind the frontiers of science, and things have changed. I pulled this from page 49 of this textbook. It's the evolution of the horse. And we have time going this way and horsiness going this way. <laughs> That's the most scientifically precise term we can put on that, so excuse me. But we see this little dog-like creature becoming the modern horse. And it appears that this modern horse evolved slowly and gradually from less uh, advanced species. And it's natural to presume that they improved from generation to generation. And therefore, we would conclude Darwinian evolution. And that's the simplest possible interpretation of this data. But with the information explosion, things have changed. And this is the way we should be presenting these in our textbook. That, sure, Eohippus Rudy did exist way back then, but it existed without change for thousands of generations. And this is true for every advanced life form, whether it be the pig, the horse, the sheep, or whatever, uh, snakes, fish, you'll see that there are gaps, and species exist with very little change. Geophysicists now tell us that magnetic reversals also regularly exterminate life from our planet. And that's why I said earlier that there are thousands of miracles in the bringing about of life on our planet, not just the 12 we see in Genesis 1, but thousands. Because the only explanation we have for the reappearance of life is by divine input. Gave me uh, time or time before last this little poster. And I think I shared, with, shared it with you when I got it, but it's so appropriate I'll mention it tonight. It's really an artist's rendering of a sequence of men going from one side to the other. And uh, the first man is a Heidelberg man. And then the subtitle under here says, it's built from a jawbone that was conceded by many to be quite human. Then the Nebraska man scientifically built up from one tooth and later found uh, to be the tooth of an extinct pig. Um, and I'm going to come back to some of these. It's really quite interesting. The Nebraska man was not only an absurd extension of ideas from a trivial amount of data. You know, Mark Twain mentioned that. He was so fascinated by this field of science because you can come to such wholesale conclusions with such economic evidence. It takes very little evidence to come to sweeping conclusions. But uh, this, of course, was not only uh, rather bizarre, but it, this, the tooth that, around which they built the whole idea of the Nebraska man was later found out to be a tooth of an extinct pig. And as the papers at the time picked up, it was the first time that uh, a pig made a monkey out of a man. But anyway, <laughs> uh, Piltown, the Piltown man, was, uh, the jawbone turned out to belong to a modern ape. The Peking man, all the evidence has disappeared, and that's a whole story. The Neanderthal man in 1958 at the International Congress of Zoology Dr. A.J. E. Kav, uh, said that his examination of the famous Neanderthal skeleton found in France over 50 years ago is that of an old man who suffered from arthritis. And then there's a Cro-Magnon man, and it just mentions that this is one of the earliest and best established fossils is at least equal in physique and brain capacity to modern man, so what's the difference? What it doesn't mention, by the way, is a Cro-Magnon man applying the concepts of phrenology or craniology or whatever you call it, uh, probably had an intellect and superior strength to modern man as we think of him. So if, in fact, he was representative forebear, there's been a decline. But um, uh, modern man, uh, this genius thinks that we came from a monkey. That's modern man. And uh, then it quotes Romans 1.22, professing themselves to be wise, they became as fools. My first instinct, and I, and I gathered a lot of notes in this direction, which I'm going to spare you the details of, but I will just highlight so you get the flavor of what we could do. There was the Heidelberg man, of course, which was, was created entirely out of just the findings of a jaw, which later investigations proved was human. The Nebraska man, which was 1922, Henry Osborne. The whole thing is built up from the single tooth, which I mentioned. The Piltown man, sometimes called the Dawn man, 1912. Charles Dawson and another guy found a jawbone, 
which later turned out to be that of the modern ape. But here's the point. Um, they discovered upon examination that it had been treated with iron salts to make it look old, and the, the, the subsequent treatment also revealed fire, file marks where they modified the thing to become a fraud. The point I'm going to make when I get through here, well, let me go on, I'll come back. Uh, in 1921, the so-called Peking man, uh, all the evidence that's gone, and that also is a whole complex story in which there's not only misguided intent or uh, pre prejudice or presumption, there's actually the active fabrication of a fraud, an attempt to gain fame and notoriety by uh, fraudulently uh, uh, creating evidence. The Neanderthal man we mentioned, the Cro-Magnon man uh, we mentioned. There's also the Java man, which is one of the first things. Du Bois found this in 1891. He's one of the earliest examples of this sort of thing. Found a skull cap and also about 50 feet away a femur or thigh bone. And he also found some other things that he didn't disclose then. He concealed some evidence of some other teeth, which later, in fact, they in fact uh, disproved the hypothesis that he was trying to sell. First of all, there was no linking of this thigh bone with the skull cap he found. They're 50 feet apart in the dig, and there's no reason necessarily to link them. But anyway, in 1922, some 30 years later, he revealed some other things he had found at that same dig, and the significance of that was very obvious because it tended to destroy his whole hypothesis. But also, and the teeth of the thing was also that he found that were involved in this turned out to be that of an orangutan. And he himself, before he died, admitted that this was probably the fragments of a large gibbon, or it's a form of simian or, or ape. Well, the point is, those of you, it occurred to me, rather than go into all of this and spend a lot of time, um, those of you that are into this and would like to dig into it, um, uh, there's, there are several books, paperback in most of Christian bookstores. One's called The Ape Men, Fact or Fallacy. The other one, very widely quoted, very scholarly work, in fact, in that sense, maybe even a little tedious, is Gish's book called Evolution, colon, The Fossils Say No. And the main impact of these books isn't just to go through all these examples. The thing that you'll discover if you take the trouble, those of you interested in this, go ahead and dig those books out and read them. What you need to realize is none of the traditional paleontological example that you're, you may remember from your high school textbooks have been validated. Most of them have been totally debunked. They made a lot of press when they were discovered some 10, 20, 50 years later when somebody discovered something that proved them as frauds. The press didn't really play it up. It's nothing secret. It's been published, but it hasn't gotten the visibility. In fact, most people today, if you mention these, assume that they're examples, and, they, they, and this is, continues to get promoted by National Geographic or Life Magazine summaries and things. The point is, not only are they not scientifically valid, in most cases they are the result of an overt attempt to deceive. Water is interesting for lots of other reasons. Of course, it's the most plentiful thing on the planet Earth, I guess. But also, it violates some of the laws of nature. You all know that when things get hot, it expands, and things get cold, they contract. The reason highways have bumps in them, you've got what they call expansion joints. In Dallas, they weren't quite good enough, and they exploded, as you may know, because the expansion joints, uh, you know, it was exceeded what they needed. So you have things, things in general expand when they're hot, contract when they're cold, and as a mechanic, you know this, if you've got a force fit that's tough, you can heat it, and sometimes something that's intractable will yield if it's made larger, and so forth. There's a measurable coefficient of expansion per degree centigrade, and you deal with this as an engineer or a mechanic, what have you. There are a few things that do the opposite. There are a few metals that actually contract when heated and expand when cold. And they're used to make pendulum on clocks and things that should, so their temperature, you know, the pendulum stays the same length in different temperatures. Yeah, there are some materials that violate this, but uniformly. Water doesn't either. When water, and I'll speak in Fahrenheit because we're used to that, when it gets to 38 degrees, it stops contracting. It tends to somewhat contract as it gets colder, down to 38 degrees. From 38 degrees to freezing, it starts to expand, and it expands 30% when freezing. And it turns and it has a very nonlinear, very peculiar curve. If you in a laboratory try to plot its expand, you know, its 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 volume per temperature, it's a very erratic curve. But the curve has been designed so that first of all, in a local region, everything will be the same temperature locally before it freezes, and when it freezes, it can, so it can expand. Now, what's interesting about this? I imagine how many of you knew that before tonight. You knew that by reading Job 26? 
Yes, it's in Job 26. It, he, he ponders the fact that, you know, that uh, water is like a stone that doesn't, that floats, won't sink. If water didn't do that, we probably have very great difficulty supporting life on the planet Earth. Because rivers would freeze from the bottom up. And many of them would never defrost. And if you make an ecological study of the planet Earth, you discover you probably have to alter the basic properties of water in order to have life on the planet Earth. And guess what? Those properties are altered to the nonlinearity we experience in the laboratory. Very interesting. Um, something else that's kind of interesting, um, the ratio of Earth to land on the planet Earth observes a square law. If you took half, if you had half the seas, you'd have one-fourth the rainfall. It turns out if you play around with the ratio of Earth to water on the Earth, on the planet Earth, uh, it turns out to be a very sensitive adjustment. You want, it, you want just the right amount of land versus water to create the properties we enjoy. And we could go through a whole list tonight. Now, relax. I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, this whole idea of, of um, how close is, should the Earth be to the sun. If it's a hair closer, it gets too hot. The heat avoids does not allow you to have an atmosphere, among a lot of other problems it creates. It gets a little further from the sun, it gets too cold. Mercury, by the way, has seven times the heat that the Earth has. Very uncomfortable. <laughs> you might get a kick out of it. It has an 87-day year. So, you know, time flies. But um, <laughs> Uranus, in contrast to that, has one hundredth of the heat that the Earth has. It's high. The weatherman on Uranus says, the high today is minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> a birthday would be rather rare because it has an 84 year year. Okay. So, I mean, our, our, it, it would take 84 times as long to have a year as we do. So Uranus isn't really too, real estate there is cheap probably. Um, um, very delicate situation. Uh, before I leave this, this whole idea of, of water, though, I discovered something relatively late in my now, I'm a Naval Academy graduate, and as a Naval Academy graduate, I spent four years marching down Stribling Rock Walk to the academic group of buildings, one of which was called Maury Hall. And I knew, as most people in the world, not just Americans know, Matthew Fontaine Maury, M-A-U-R-Y, happened to be an American naval officer, but he also found, he's known as the father of oceanography in all countries. He was one of these guys way, way back that got interested in oceanography and laid the, he did the beginning of that whole science by gathering data and publishing some things. And he, not just in America, but all over the world, is, is acknowledged as the father of oceanography. What I didn't know was how he got interested in oceanography. He heard in church one day a sermon preached on Psalm 8. And in Psalm 8, there's a phrase. It speaks of water uh, paths in the sea. And he was freaked out by that. He says there are paths in the sea. And he decided to try and find out where they were. And he started, he organized ways of taking data among all the ships that sailed certain courses. And he gathered that data and laid out maps and, and discovered what we know today as the basic currents in the world, worldwide, around the world. We speak of the Gulf Stream and all these things. And he, he, he mapped most of them by very rudimentary data back in the, when was it, 1800s, I guess. And, um, but what fascinated me, he, he got onto that by um, Psalm 8. There are all kinds of evidence of a worldwide catastrophe of all kinds, all kinds of evidence. Sedimentary rocks is one thing. You notice how sedimentary rocks always have layers and so forth? One of the things, if you study the field of hydrology, you'll discover that they have to be made quickly. If it takes millions of years to do those layers, they get disturbed and they're not conformable, to use that term. So one of the interesting things, that we, they require incredible pressures, but interestingly enough, have to be done relatively quickly. A mile deep only takes 220 days if you really go through the arithmetic. So the whole existence of sedimentary rocks implies, incidentally, a catastrophe, because it implies pressures and the rest of it happening quickly. But more importantly is the advent of fossils. We've heard from the evolutionists till we're getting tired of it, of all about the fossil records. Fossil records are very, very strange. To date a fossil, the way you date a rock layer is to determine what fossils are found in it, and that determines the date. The way you determine how old a fossil is is what layer was it found in. Now, I'm not being facetious. If you follow the, the, the art, I won't call it a science, of that, 
you'll discover that it's circular reasoning. I was fascinated. I think it was Ironside when I was a kid. I remember reading a book on that where he says that uh, it's like it's circular reasoning. You visualize a dog chasing its tail. And he pointed out the only difference between them and the dog is the dog always kept his end in view. And these guys... <laughs> now, the, there are no fossils being made today. On the bottom of the ocean's floor, when trilobites or whatever die, they don't make fossils. Do you know why? They get eaten, or they decay, or they're victims of scavengers, or what have you. The existence of a fossil intact implies a quick pressure. That the time for decay, there was no time for it to decay, or decompose, or be eaten by a scavenger. So the, fossil, the presence of fossils imply a catastrophe. It's not a natural process. So you want an evolutionist to put point, to point to a fossil? Terrific. How did they get there? I want you to recognize for something that the author of the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, was educated from a baby through his manhood. Where? In Egypt, at the best schools they had. So he learned all the, quote, wisdom, close quote, of the Egyptians. Now, you can go through, any of you who have an encyclopedia or some cultural resources at your fingertips, go through and understand how the Egyptians viewed the world, the cosmos. You know, they had some wild ideas. You know, you go back and you read some of the ancient, not just Egyptian, but but the Babylon, you name it. They had some crazy ideas, concepts of the world. You know, that was flat and all those kinds of things. But also, this whole idea of, um, you know, we, we, we rev revere Aristotle, culturally, right? Well, he divided the universe into four elements, right? Fire, water, earth, and air. Well, we may revere Aristotle for lots of things, but his physics wasn't one of them, right? And you can go through and poke fun at the conceptual understanding scientifically of the ancient color, uh, uh, cultures, all of them. And Egypt is no different. They had some strange ideas. Now what's fascinating is not just what the five books of Moses say. One of the things we, I, I would like to get in our consciousness is the things it doesn't say. It doesn't have the earth on the shoulders of Atlas standing on a turtle or whatever, okay? Now, in contrast to some of the things that we, uh, we could poke fun at, what is interesting, that in the books, in the Torah, you find suggested or underlying the rules and ordinances, the whole concept of bacteriology, which was 3,500 years later introduced by Louis Pasteur, and we are products of that culture. And so what we read there, we're quite comfortable with. We fail to appreciate that that was radical prior to the discoveries of Louis Pasteur. We talk about blood. We, we, we're very conscious of blood circulation as anticipated by Moses and Leviticus and elsewhere because we're the benefit, beneficiaries of William Harvey, is that right, uh, Dr. Miller, um, in the 1600s. So not only is that discovery, many of the discoveries we take for granted roughly in the 1600s, 17th century, and thus part of our cultural background, we take that for granted. What's amazing is that Moses also took it for granted, and his taking it for granted, as his evidence writing, is remarkable, recognizing Acts 7.22, that he was schooled from ground up in all the learning and the wisdom of the Egyptians. Sterilization, quarantine, these are ideas that, that we attribute to Joseph Lister, also in the 17th century as radical innovations, not endemic to Egypt, Babylon, Assyria, you name it. <laughs> in fact, you can go in Iraq and Syria today and wonder if they have read anything about Joseph. I shouldn't say that. Uh, some of these cultures, though, frankly, are pretty primitive. And one of the problems in what we sometimes consider an underdeveloped country situation um, is, is, is an awareness of basic hygiene. The, book, the Torah has in it, endemic in it, is basic hygiene. Uh, 
evaporation condensation, I'd like to get in that more specifically. The whole, we talked about the flat world, right? You know, the, uh, Isaiah in chapter 40 saying, is he that you said on the sphere of the earth, earth of the earth, and he hangs it, and Job tells us he hangs it, and Job 26 says he hangs it up in, in, in nothing, which uh, is a very, very radically modern cosmology, as, uh, as we know, as products of, of our culture. Um, I can't resist digressing a little bit because it isn't really a digression from what we're going to get into tonight. But one of the things that I think is kind of fun, contrasting the ancient cultures, is the thing that we call the water cycle. Now, we take for granted the water cycle because every night at 10 o'clock we watch the news. At the end, we see the satellite view of the Earth and we have the temperatures and all this stuff. So we're very sophisticated meteorologically. Very interesting, the largest computers that have ever been built are still most challenged by trying to build models of the water, you know, the meteorological system. So it's not trivial. Solomon poses a question in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. And it's a very interesting question. In verse 7 he says, All the rivers run into the sea, and yet the sea is not full. You ever wondered about that? Can you imagine a small boy sitting at the Mississippi Delta or whatever, watching this river? You know, go downstream continually, day and night. keeps rolling into the ocean. But the ocean doesn't get any higher. It tries every six hours to get a little higher, but you discover those are tides. That doesn't rattle you too much. But you watch you know, all over the world, rivers run into the sea, yet the sea doesn't fill up. That puzzled Solomon. Verse 6 and 7. Uh, verse 6 and 7. The wind goeth toward the south and turneth about again to the north. It whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to its circuits. That's a remarkable insight. We call that the cyclonic system. And you can spend a lot, you know, you can blow a lot of your college time messing around in that area if you're uh, not careful. Verse, uh, All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. Well, that's a pretty interesting thing. You mean the circle, the cycle is closed. Terrific. How can it be closed? Understand the, the fact that the air is in circuits is interesting. The fact that there are paths that the air follows around the earth itself is an interesting insight for Solomon, who did not have the beneficiary, was not the beneficiary of aerial photographs, let alone satellite pictures like you and I are. Water weighs about 800 times what air does. Furthermore, salt water, which is what we're dealing with, has contaminants that will kill plant life. So how does, it, how does it happen? Well, Job tells us. Let's turn to Job 36. Job 36, and we'll look for about verse 27. Back, we should start at verse 26. It's a neat verse. We'll pick it up on our way. Uh, Behold, God is great, and we know him not, neither can, we number his ye- neither can the number of his years be searched out. To me, that sounds like he's not in our time domain. Just as an aside. He maketh small the drops of water. They pour down rain according to their vapor, which clouds do drop and distill upon man abundantly. Now, the way you get the salt out of the water is you distill it. If you've taken a you know, first-year chemistry course or whatever, you know what distillation is. It's not, not a trivial process, but that's how the salt gets out of the water. And if, when you, take, you can go to Psalm 135, verses 6 and 7. Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that he did that did he in heaven and in earth and in the seas and all deep places. He caused causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh the lightnings for the rain. He bringeth out the wind, the wind out of his treasuries, and so forth. And and so you can put these three passages together, Ecclesiastes chapter one, Job thirty six, and Psalm one hundred and thirty five, and get a description. That's a pretty passable description for a high school physics book about the water cycle. For those of you that are interested, you can find all kinds of scholastic scientific works which argue for what's called the young earth. There's an incredible amount of scientific data which argues eloquently for an earth no no longer than 10,000 years. And uh, that's a shock to many people who have been conditioned by a preschool or even college in some cases, uh, or I should say a geological orientation to our, our cosmology.
And that's one view, a view that's getting increasingly under criticism in view of modern discovery. There is a scientist, a mathematician by the name of Bernoulli, who raised the question of giving the bird at an altitude, what's the fast, what, what trajectory is the fastest way down to an arbitrary point on the surface? And it, two scientists operating independently came up with the same answer after a great deal of study. Sir Isaac Newton was one of them. And you know who he was. He was the guy that invented calculus. One of the great, great minds in the history of mankind, just as, a, as, a, as an intellect. The other one is Leibniz, one of the greatest mathematicians that has ever lived. And these two guys independently attacked Bernoulli's problem and came up with the same answer but working independently. And the answer is a mathematical equation that we call a cycloid. Now, if I was going to draw a cycloid on a blackboard, the way I would probably do it is to take a wheel and put a piece of chalk on the perimeter of the wheel and then roll the wheel on the chalk tray and I'd get a curve. <coughs> You can visualize that. It looks sort of like a spiral in a sense, okay? It's called a cycloid. There's a mathematical equation for it. And both Newton and Leibniz found out or discovered that a cycloid is the trajectory you'd have to follow if you were at altitude in air and were trying to find the fastest way down to the surface, okay? Now, let me tell you, by the way, if I asked you to either draw or, or, or calculate a cycloid, I don't think you could, if you were flying a plane, I don't think you could do it without an autopilot or some kind of computer to help you. Because it, otherwise you'd approximate it. You wouldn't be really a cycloid. You following me? All birds of prey follow a cycloid. If you ever watch them, it, the, the radius gets so large when they hit the water, it looks like they're going straight down. But they're actually following a cycloid. Very interesting thing. I'm just pointing out there's some non-trivial design problems that are either solved by these birds of prey or more likely by the guy that programmed them in the first place. How many of you uh, have read articles or, or read in a novel about the vulture that smells the scent of the carrion and so forth? Do you know that they don't do that with scent? Th that they do it by eyesight, and that's exactly what Job tells us in Job 28? I think it's exciting how science and mathematics is helping us understand the scripture. I don't think, I think you all in this audience are sophisticated enough to understand that the science does not disprove the Bible, quite the contrary. Where science is true science, it is supported, perhaps. And we need to understand that when we get a discovery that's consistent with the scripture, that doesn't support the scripture, it simply says our discovery is valid. Do you know where the center of our galactic system is? It's located approximately in the constellation known as the Pleiades. And that's what Job said. That's a pretty good insight for a guy that didn't own a telescope. Do attack Darwinian evolution. It's scientifically untenable, recognized by the scientists at the frontiers. So... Feel very confident attacking that, but don't attack natural selection. And natural selection and Darwinian evolution are not the same thing. Natural selection says that a species can improve through survival of the fittest, but that that species remains the same species. Very minor improvements, like butterflies changing colors. Uh, butterflies in England before the Industrial Revolution were green. They're now gray and black. Uh, the green ones, when the Industrial Revolution began, were easily picked off by birds, and the black and the gray ones survived. That's natural selection, very well established. We can even observe natural selection in the human race. The average eyesight in this room is about three times more precise than it was at the time of Christ. We can resolve stars three times closer together than the people with the best eyesight could at the time of Christ. That was simply brought about by natural selection. It has nothing to do with the changing of our genes or our chromosomes. It's just simply the fact that those with poor eyesight had a better chance of getting killed in battle and in the marketplace than those who had good eyesight. 
So don't attack natural selection. Uh, it's well established. There's nothing in the Bible that says that natural selection cannot operate. Some of you may be familiar with this watch that I wear. This happens to be a digital watch because what I can do with this watch, of course, is get the time in several time zones. I can uh, have a cal uh, you know, calculator and a date function, and I can tell you if you give me your birth date, I can tell you the day of the week you were born on. Uh, those of you that are financial people, I can tell you the rate of return on a call option that expires the third Friday in April. Um, <laughs> it consists of uh, 36,000 circuits behind a display and uh, a 28 key, I think it's 28, uh, anyway, or is it 30, a 30 key, key keyboard. And uh, so we could play with this and I could, t I could waste your time tonight by demonstrating some of the little things you can play. But uh, if I told you that 30 engineers uh, spent two years designing the five little silicon chips that make this up and uh, organizing it all with a quartz crystal to keep time within two or three seconds a year and so forth, um, you'd probably believe me. And I hate to be the one to break the news to you tonight, but that's just a cover story. What actually happened was that billions of years ago, there were random atoms floating through the cosmos. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> These atoms were tossed about by the winds of cosmic change, and some of them came to be perfect pieces of silicon, and others perfect pieces of metal shape, just the right size. The distance between some of the circuits is so small that light itself can't resolve them. If you're going to fix the circuits, you need an electron microscope. But that's okay. It all happened uh, through billions of years of, of cosmic change. And all these little keys were labeled. <laughs> Zero, one, two, three, four, five. You think I'm putting you on, don't you? Why? Why? Why can I tell you a story about this watch evolving as the result of a cosmic roulette wheel, and you laugh. When I can show you that the hand that it rests on is far more complex than the watch is, and yet the average person today is willing to accept the existence of the hand without an architect, and yet the proposition is so ridiculous as to be a, to be a reasonable approach to humor, if I take something less complicated and suggest that it happened by accident. But we're going to get into the subject of entropy. We're going to discover that if we were subjected as a culture to a time reversal, there's probably only one way we could tell if time was going backwards. How would you tell if time was going backwards? If all things are relative and time is reversing, everything is in order, but just going backwards. How would you tell? It turns out most of the things that you would think of to try and tell won't work. But if you go home and tech, take a deck of playing cards and shuffle them, and every time you shuffle them, they become more ordered, you know that you're in a time reversal. Because one of the processes that we deal with every day has to do with the law, entropy laws. Entropy is a fancy word for meaning randomness. And there's a second law of thermodynamics, which applies the entropy laws to the field of physics, which says that we're winding down. Everything that we observe in the heavens above and in the earth beneath is going from order towards chaos, from a high temperature to a lower temperature, to, to randomness. And those laws are the entropy laws, sometimes embody the second law of thermodynamics. There is only one case in the universe, where the entropy laws are violated. We call that life. But the, the whole proposition of evolution, the whole proposition of a universe without an architect, flies in the face of scientific knowledge as we think of it.
But if I had a hologram here tonight and held it up, it would look like a piece of gray. It looks like a darkroom mistake. It's a piece of gray film. And as you look at it, it's got no, you know, under natural light. It looks like a, a piece of screwed up film. It's gray and it, you can't see anything on it. Just fuzzy, you know. But if I illuminate that with a laser light, now a laser is simply well-organized light, light that comes from the sources you're familiar with tends to be disorganized. It's not temporarily coherent. That is, it's not, it doesn't stay in step with itself, and it also isn't collimated in a lot of things. But if you take a laser, you can organize it so it's the way you want it, very well-organized. And if I had a hologram and I illuminated it with a laser and you looked at it, you would see an image, like this little gray piece of, let's say a gray window I'm holding up here, would look like a window in a three-dimensional world. If I had, say, a ruby, uh, you know, a neon ion uh, laser, or helium, I mean, a helium uh, neon laser, it would look reddish. If I had an argon ion, it would look greenish, but whatever color the laser happened to be. But the point is, you would see an image. The image would be three-dimensional. Let me explain what I mean by that, because I believe it or not, this is coming to a spiritual thing. I have a tie on, and no comments about my choice in ties. <laughs> Don says that was a gift, I presume. <laughs> and if I held my Bible up so that it covers the tie and you stood there and took a photograph now a photograph is an image in the spatial dimension the, 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 the pieces on the photograph comply geometrically with what was there when you saw me right? and I held there's no way you could tell my tie what color it was or what pattern it has from over there right? if you were looking through this little window at a hologram you could move your eye over here and see around my Bible and see the tie. You follow me what I mean by a three-dimensional image? You, as you move your eye, you can see around things just as if they're there. If I took a group of objects and put four holograms, you could walk around this little box and you would not be able to tell that those little figurines or whatever weren't actually inside the box. You reach to the top, you find there's nothing there. It's all just an image. It's a three-dimensional image. How does this happen? Well, the way you make a hologram is you illuminate some object with a laser, and you illuminate a piece of film at the same time. Same time. And the light rays that hit the, the piece of film directly and the light rays that are reflected off the, off the object interfere with one another and create... You, what you really record in the film is the interference or the difference between them. So if you look at the hologram very closely, you see a, a strange little pattern on there. But every piece of information in the image is diffused over the whole surface of the hologram. The hologram is a Fourier transform of the space domain. It's, it's the image in the frequency domain. And I mentioned we have, we have transfer functions in engineering. We have Fourier transforms, Laplace transforms, Lorentz transforms. There are ways of translating something from one domain to the other. We live in the space-time domain. You can translate that in the frequency domain. A hologram is an example of that. Why am I going through all this? Because God has given us an absolutely fantastic analogy that I have to share with you. Um, if I had a, um, a, a, a this picture, this little gray window, and, you, and it's illuminated with a laser, and you look through it, there's an object there. Let's assume I drilled a hole or I cut away one square inch of, say, a 10 by 10 inch window. I cut out a little one inch square. Would you lose anything of the image. You'd have a defect right in the middle of your hologram, right? But you can look around it, right? So you can, it's just like having a window with a little spot on it. It doesn't bother your, appear, your ability to look inside the room, does it? So the hologram has a very strange property. I can cut it into pieces and not lose the image. I can cut half of it away and I have not lost half the image. I got all the image. I just got a smaller window to look through. I lose resolution. The details are not quite as sharp as before. But if I give you a, a one-inch square hologram or a foot square hologram, one just gives you a, a sharp, more sharply defined image. You follow me? Now, why am I going through it? The hologram is a Fourier transform of a thing. Good. I take a laser, I illuminate it, and I get a, a hologram. And if I illuminate the hologram with a laser, I can reconstruct this three-dimensional image in the first place. <clears throat> if I held up the hologram in natural light, it would look gray. It has no form. It has no form nor comeliness that you should desire it. But if I take the hologram and I illuminate it with the light that created it in the first place, I get a three-dimensional image. 
And I have here a hologram. And in natural light, the natural man does not discern the things of God. It has no, he, he had no form nor comeliness that we should desire. But if we allow this to be illuminated by the light that created it in the first place, we have an image of whom? Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, that image is created on every page and every verse from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22, so on. Now, if I take a hologram and I illuminate it by a laser of a different frequency, of a different frequency, I get a false image. I get a distorted image. So I have a false light, I get a false image. If yeah, I have the light that created in the first place, I have a true image. And I, 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 there's a, a, we could go on for a whole hour on the subtleties of that model. But it's absolutely fascinating. If I drill a hole in the hologram, I don't lose any of the message. Tear, tear a page of your Bible and throw it away. And have you lost any key doctrine? No. Because God has engineered his message system so that you can lose part of it and not lose the message of salvation of Jesus Christ. You'll lose some subtlety, some bit of resolution. Some things may not be as crisply in focus. But you can suffer substantial degradation and still have the essence of the gospel of Jesus Christ, how God became man and gave himself that you might live, and that he did the whole job requiring only acceptance from you, just to accept it. You can't add anything to what he's done. The whole gospel is from cover to cover. It's a hologram, if you will, of, of Jesus Christ. Well, now, um, it's also interesting that in the Gospel of John, as we open the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word and so forth, and nothing was made but that which he made and so forth. He immediately is introduced as the light of the world. But men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Something else he's done. We now have learned a lot about secret messages and how you code messages to keep them from being jammed. We call it electronic warfare. And those of you that are engineers here know that if you're going to send a message down a channel and you're expecting hostile jamming, you take your message and you distribute it over the available bandwidth. Very interesting. It's exactly what the scripture has done. And as we understand the structure of the scripture, we're fascinated to recognize that it's organized so as to minimize its exposure to hostile jamming. Because not only did it come from outside the time domain to reach us, it anticipated intelligent, antagonistic jamming. We, we discover we have a misconception of eternity. We think of time as a linear dimension in which some point is a beginning and another point on a line is an end and that interval, that line segment is a, can be correlative to a lifetime or a piece of history or something else. And if we think of an eternal being, we think of somebody who's on a line that goes, starts from infinity on our left and goes to infinity on our right. And we think of, in effect, we assume somebody that has an eternal existence is someone who simply has a lots of time, a very long line that's infinitely long. And that's a conceptual error. Because an eternal being, if he is free of mass, is outside the time domain altogether and can see the end from the beginning, intrinsically. Now, if that being is outside our time domain altogether and has for some reason a desire to communicate to us who are subject to the constraints of a time domain, how would he validate his message? Assuming he has a technology, as he obviously would have, to get a message to us, how would he put a signature on that message to let us know that the origin of that message had to occur from outside our time domain? Very easy. He would tell us the end from the beginning. And that's exactly what God has done with the scripture. He describes from the front the end. He knows the end from the beginning, and he lays that out in such detail that there's parts of it we can see and validate to recognize the source of our message, and by giving us the context of the whole, he can allow us to put ourselves in perspective of his plan.